we get back to, to somatostain analogs, though, I, we talked about somatostain analogs and how they can be very effective in controlling uh, carcinoid syndrome and other symptoms of hormone hypersecretion. Uh, that's not the only goal of somatostain analogs, though. So maybe, Jennifer, when, when you start a patient on a somatostain analog, what are, what are the things that you're looking for? What are your goals? Right, so in addition to trying to control the hormone-mediated symptoms, if patients have those, uh, somatostatin analogs are also actually very useful in trying to control tumor growth. So the PROMID study initially showed that to be the case in, uh, in med-gut carcinoids, where there was a significantly improved time to disease progression, and it showed that we were able to try to keep the disease stable for an extended period of time. And so we essentially are able to use uh, somatostatin analogs as oftentimes a frontline therapy for management of tumor growth. Uh, moving beyond that, the clarinet study looking at re lanreotide in a broader population, including uh, additional bowel carcinoids as well as pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, saw similar results. So essentially for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and bowel carcinoids, we're able to use somatostatin analogs in an effort to try and control tumor growth as well. So one, you know, one question that comes up, and I'll throw this out uh, to the group, uh, there's really no data looking at sequence of therapies. Uh, so why would we choose a somatostain analog over some of the new exciting targeted therapies as, as a first-line uh, treatment? I'll, I'll start with you, James. Yeah, that's really a great question. Um, and here's an area where I'm not actually terribly sure that sequencing is nearly as important as um, you know, many other diseases. Because with many you know, fast-growing aggressive tumor, if the first-line therapy doesn't work, you're losing patients already. Uh, by and large, uh, we know from the clinical trial experience with the phase three studies, you know, most of these patients, when they have progression, they do have you know, plenty of opportunity to go on uh, other types of therapy. So I think really it's about you know, the patient, what they do want, and, you know, what, it, what do we want to emphasize in mean, patients with very low volume disease, very little symptoms, and quality of life may be a major uh, factor in the decision point. And you may pick, pick a somatostatin analogs because it's very well tolerated and, and so forth. But there are other situations where the patient's, you know, very symptomatic from tumor volume. And you really want, um, you know, essentially a big cytal reduction. And there it may make sense to do some of the more aggressive cytotoxic therapy if it's a poorly differentiated tumor or a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. So the situation, I think, uh, may help us decide. I think in, in general, probably safe to say that uh, these are quite well-tolerated drugs, so it's an easy thing to go to as an as a initial step.